Chapter 9 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 9 Perfect Self Expression or The Divine Design. No wind can drive my bark astray, nor change the tide of destiny. There is for each man perfect self-expression. There is a place which he is to fill, and no one else can fill, something which he is to do, which no one else can do. It is his destiny. This achievement is held, a perfect idea in divine mind, awaiting man's recognition. As the imaging faculty is the creative faculty, it is necessary for man to see the idea before it can manifest. So man's highest demand is for the divine design of his life. He may not have the faintest conception of what it is, for there is possibly some marvelous talent hidden deep within him. His demand should be, Infinite Spirit, open the way for the divine design of my life to manifest. Let the genius within me now be released. Let me see clearly the perfect plan. The perfect plan includes health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. This is the square of life, which brings perfect happiness. When one has made this demand, he may find great changes taking place in his life, for nearly every man has wandered far from the divine design. I know in one woman's case it was as though a cyclone had struck her affairs, but readjustments came quickly, and new and wonderful conditions took the place of old ones. Perfect self-expression will never be labor, but of such absorbing interest that it will seem almost like play. The student knows also, as man comes into the world financed by God, the supply needed for his perfect self-expression will be at hand. Many a genius has struggled for years with the problem of supply, when his spoken word and faith would have released quickly the necessary funds. For example... After the class one day, a man came to me and handed me a cent. He said, I have just seven cents in the world, and I'm going to give you one, for I have faith in the power of your spoken word. I want you to speak the word for my perfect self-expression and prosperity. I spoke the word and did not see him again until a year later. He came in one day, successful and happy, with a roll of yellow bills in a pocket. He said, Immediately after you spoke the word, I had a position offered me in a distant city, and am now demonstrating health, happiness, and supply. A woman's self-expression may be in becoming a perfect wife, a perfect mother, a perfect homemaker, and not necessarily in having a public career. Demand definite leads, and the way will be made easy and successful. One should not visualize or force a mental picture. When he demands the divine design to come into his conscious mind, he will receive flashes of inspiration and begin to see himself making some great accomplishment. This is the picture or idea he must hold without wavering. The thing man seeks is seeking him. The telephone was seeking Bell. Parents should never force careers and professions upon their children. With a knowledge of spiritual truth, the divine plan could be spoken for early in childhood or prenatally. A prenatal treatment should be, Let the God in this child have perfect self-expression. Let the divine design of his mind, body, and affairs be made manifest throughout his life, throughout eternity. God's will be done, not man's. God's pattern, not man's pattern, is the command we find running through all the scriptures, and the Bible is a book dealing with the science of the mind.
It is a book telling man how to release his soul or subconscious mind from bondage. The battles described are pictures of man waging war against mortal thoughts. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Every man is Jehoshaphat, and every man is David, who slays Goliath, mortal thinking, with the little white stone, faith. So man must be careful that he is not the wicked and slothful servant who buried his talent. There is a terrible penalty to be paid for not using one's ability. Often, fear stands between man and his perfect self-expression. Stage fright has hampered many a genius. This may be overcome by the spoken word or treatment. The individual then loses all self-consciousness and feels simply that he is a channel for infinite intelligence to express itself through. He is under direct inspiration, fearless and confident, for he feels that it is the Father within who does the work. A young boy came often to my class with his mother. He asked me to speak the word for his coming examinations at school. I told him to make the statement, I am one with infinite intelligence. I know everything I should know on this subject. He had an excellent knowledge of history, but was not sure of his arithmetic. I saw him afterwards, and he said, I spoke the word for my arithmetic and passed with the highest honors, but I thought I could depend upon myself for history and got a very poor mark. Man often receives a setback when he is too sure of himself, which means he is trusting to his personality and not the father within. Another of my students gave me an example of this. She took an extended trip abroad one summer, visiting many countries where she was ignorant of the languages. She was calling for guidance and protection every minute, and her affairs went smoothly and miraculously. Her luggage was never delayed nor lost. Accommodations were always ready for her at the best hotels, and she had perfect service wherever she went. She returned to New York. Knowing the language, she felt God was no longer necessary, so looked after her affairs in an ordinary manner. Everything went wrong. Her trunks delayed amid inharmony and confusion. The student must form the habit of practicing the presence of God every minute. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Nothing is too small or too great. Sometimes an insignificant incident may be the turning point in a man's life. Robert Fulton, watching some boiling water simmering in a tea kettle, saw a steamboat. I have seen a student often keep back his demonstration through resistance or pointing the way. He pins his faith to one channel only and dictates just the way he desires the manifestation to come, which brings things to a standstill. My way, not your way, is the command of infinite intelligence. Like all power, be it steam or electricity, it must have a non-resistant engine or instrument to work through, and man is that engine or instrument. Over and over again, man is told to stand still. O oh, Judah, fear not, but tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You shall not need to fight this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. We see this in the incidents of the $2,000 coming to the woman through the landlord when she became non-resistant and undisturbed, and the woman who won the man's love after all suffering had ceased. The student's goal is poise. Poise is power. For it gives God power a chance to rush through man, to will and to do its good pleasure. Poised, he thinks clearly and makes right decisions quickly. He never misses a trick. Anger blurs the visions, poisons the blood, is the root of many diseases, and causes wrong decision leading to failure. It has been named one of the worst sins, as its reaction is so harmful. 
The student learns that in metaphysics, sin has a much broader meaning than in the old teaching. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He finds that fear and worry are deadly sins. They are inverted faith, and through distorted mental pictures bring to pass the thing he fears. His work is to drive out these enemies from the subconscious mind. When man is fearless, he is finished. Maeterlinck says that man is God afraid. So as we read in the previous chapters, Man can only vanquish fear by walking up to the thing he is afraid of. When Jehoshaphat and his army prepared to meet the enemy, singing, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever, they found their enemies had destroyed each other, and there was nothing to fight. For example, a woman asked a friend to deliver a message to another friend. The woman feared to give the message as the reasoning mind said, don't get mixed up in this affair. Don't give that message. She was troubled in spirit, for she had given her promise. At last she determined to walk up to the lion and call on the law of divine protection. She met the friend to whom she was to deliver the message. She opened her mouth to speak it when her friend said, So-and-so has left town. This made it unnecessary to give the message as a situation depended upon the person being in town. As she was willing to do it, she was not obliged to. As she did not fear, the situation vanished. The student often delays his demonstration through a belief in incompletion. He should make this statement. In divine mind, there is only completion. Therefore, my demonstration is completed. My perfect word, my perfect home, my perfect health. Whatever he demands are perfect ideas registered in divine mind and must manifest under grace in a perfect way. He gives thanks he has already received on the invisible and makes active preparation for receiving on the visible. One of my students was in need of a financial demonstration. She came to me and asked why it was not completed. I replied, Perhaps you are in the habit of leaving things unfinished, and the subconscious has gotten into the habit of not completing. As the without, so the within. She said, You are right. I often begin things and never finish them. I'll go home and finish something I commenced weeks ago, and I know it will be symbolic of my demonstration. So she sewed assiduously, and the article was soon completed. Shortly thereafter, the money came in a most curious manner. Her husband was paid his salary twice that month. He told the people of their mistake, and they sent word to keep it. One man asks, believing he must receive, for God creates his own channels. I have been sometimes asked, Suppose one has several talents. How is he to know which one to choose? Demand to be shown definitely. Say, infinite spirit, give me a definite lead. Reveal to me my perfect self-expression. Show which talent I am to make use of now. I have known people to suddenly enter a new line of work and be fully equipped with little to no training, so make the statement, I am fully equipped for the divine plan of my life and be fearless in grasping opportunities. Some people are cheerful givers, but bad receivers. They refuse gifts through pride or some negative reason, thereby blocking their channels and invariably find themselves eventually with little or nothing. For example, a woman who had given away a great deal of money had a gift offered her of several thousand dollars. She refused to take it, saying she did not need it. Shortly thereafter, her finances were tied up, and she found herself in debt for that amount. Man should receive gracefully the bread returning to him upon the water. Freely ye have given, freely ye shall receive. There is always the perfect balance of giving and receiving, and though man should give without thinking of returns, 
He violates law if he does not accept the returns which come to him, for all gifts are from God, man being merely the channel. A thought of lack should never be held over the giver. For example, when the man gave me one cent, I did not say, Poor man, he cannot afford to give me that. I saw him rich and prosperous with his supply pouring in. It was this thought which brought it. If one has been a bad receiver, he must become a good one. And take even a postage stamp if it is given him and open up his channels for receiving. The Lord loveth a cheerful receiver, as well as a cheerful giver. I have often been asked why one man is born rich and healthy, and another poor and sick. Where there is an effect, there is always a cause. There is no such thing as chance. This question is answered through the law of reincarnation. Man goes through many births and deaths, until he knows the truth which sets him free. He is drawn back to the earth plane through unsatisfied desire to pay his karmic debts or to fulfill his destiny. The man born rich and healthy has had pictures in his subconscious mind, in his past life, of health and riches, and the poor and sick man of disease and poverty. Man manifests on any plane the sum total of his subconscious beliefs. However, birth and death are man-made laws, for the wages of sin is death. The Adamic fall in consciousness through the belief in two powers. The real man, spiritual man, is birthless and deathless. He was never born and has never died. As he was in the beginning, he is now and shall ever be. So through the truth, man is set free from the law of karma, sin, and death and manifests the man made in his image and likeness. Man's freedom comes through fulfilling his destiny, bringing into manifestation the divine design of his life. His Lord will say unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things, death itself. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord eternal life. End of chapter 9. Recording by Amy Conger. In this transformative chapter of the game of life and how to play it, the author beautifully guides us towards the pinnacle of our existence, a realm where our deepest aspirations and the divine design converge in perfect harmony. Drawing from the timeless teachings of Christianity, this chapter illuminates the path to self-expression, empowerment, and spiritual fulfillment. In the symphony of life, each of us possesses a unique role, a part that only we can play. Just as a musician contributes to the orchestra's harmony, our lives contribute to the grand design of the universe. This chapter encourages us to embrace our authentic selves, to express our innate talents, and to align with the divine purpose that has been intricately woven into our being. Our thoughts are powerful tools that shape our reality. By cultivating a mindset rooted in faith, gratitude, and positivity, we activate the creative forces that can manifest our desires. The author guides us to cast away doubt, fear, and limiting beliefs, replacing them with a steadfast belief in the divine's benevolent guidance. Perfect self-expression radiates a profound sense of inspiration and empowerment. It's a refreshing reminder that we are not mere spectators but active participants in the beautiful game of life. The author's blend of spiritual wisdom and Christian teachings creates a tapestry of hope that resonates deeply within the reader's soul. The chapter's uplifting tone serves as a balm for anyone feeling lost or discouraged. It encourages us to see challenges as opportunities for growth and failures as stepping stones towards success. By grounding itself in Christian principles, the chapter offers solace in the assurance that we are unconditionally loved and supported by a higher power. 
Christian teachings, infused with the essence of this chapter, remind us of our inherent worth as children of God. Our individuality is not a random occurrence, it's a deliberate creation. By embracing our uniqueness, we honor the divine's intention for our lives. In the journey of self-expression, forgiveness plays a pivotal role. Just as Christ forgave, we too must release grudges and judgments, liberating our hearts to experience true freedom. As we align our thoughts with divine truth, we channel the energy necessary for manifesting our dreams, becoming co-creators of our destiny. Chapter 9 of The Game of Life and How to Play It is a spiritual masterpiece that awakens our consciousness to the profound dance of existence. Rooted in Christian teachings, it empowers us to express our true selves and manifest our deepest desires. As we navigate life's journey, let this chapter be our guiding light, inspiring us to co-create a reality that reflects the beauty of our souls and the love of the divine.